So now that we have a good handle on verb suite and the different modules that exist inside of it, we're going to take a look at some practical examples through the Port Swigger labs that are available. Um, Port Swigger are the people who maintain verb suite currently, so they have a whole bunch of labs set up to allow you to practice a lot of these concepts. Um, just to determine if you have a good solid understanding and want to practice these different exploits on a server that is available for testing. So we're gonna start off by taking a look at some information disclosure based vulnerabilities. And I've loaded up three sample labs that we're gonna take a look at in this video. In general, the all labs section will have a list of every single lab that exists. So if you ever wanna access any of them, this would be the place to go for that. Um, again, I'll put this into the resources section of this course so that you're able to access this um, whenever you would like to do that. So we're gonna start off by taking a look at information disclosures and error messages. And essentially, if we're able to cause an error on the web page, we may be able to expose information about um, things that are being used on the web server. And then from that, we might be able to find vulnerabilities with those things. So let's go ahead and access the lab and let's take a look at what sort of things we may be able to do here. So with this lab, we have a shop, and in this shop, we can view details on different products. And one thing you'll notice immediately is that the product ID is available inside of the URL, and we can generally change it to different IDs, and we'll get different products. Inside of Burp Suite, we can, of course, see this through the target sitemap. Um, it's very easy to pick up on those because they'll have the parameters checkmark next to them. So this is an easy way that we can determine anything that has parameters and parameters are things that we're able to control, which means that they're things that we want to try inputting stuff into to see what happens. So in general, if I wanna try exploiting this, what I can do is I can take a look at my request and I can see that I have a product ID that's enabled inside of it and I can potentially change the product ID to something in order to cause an error or um, expose some information to me. So to do this in Burp Suite, I'm gonna send this to the repeater. And then with the repeater, what we can do is we can of course change this product ID to something else just to see what might end up happening. For instance, if I change it to three and send it, um, I'll of course get a render of a page that has the product related to ID three. Now the question would be like, what if we do something like crazy? Like maybe I can put in a product ID that doesn't exist. Um, in this case, it gives me a not found error. So that's not particularly interesting. Um, but one other thought that I have here is, well, it's expecting a numerical input for the product ID. So let's go ahead and put in some text and see what happens. When I do this, you'll see that I instead get a 500 internal server error. This is definitely interesting to us. Any sort of internal server errors are always a good sort of indication that something has gone wrong. It means that either um, there's something that we can exploit here, or some information that we can gather. In this case, we have, of course, our stack trace, which tells us information about what the application is doing. We can see it tries to parse an integer and fails. Um, that's what happened when we put in the text, right? It just runs a parse int, it fails on that. So it gives us this stack trace. But most interesting here is that we get this leak of the Apache Struts version. Apache Struts is sort of like one of the backend uh, open source softwares that's being used to process these web pages. Now, the reason why this is interesting to me is because I can go ahead and I can look up that specific version of Apache Struts and look up vulnerabilities associated with it. And on sites like CVE details, you'll get a nice nifty list of all the vulnerabilities that could potentially exist for that version of Apache struts. From here, I can of course look for anyone who's created like a proof of concept or a module for this. And then I can use these exploits to potentially um, exploit this web page. So any exposure of information like this through error messages is really bad. We wanna make sure that these sort of things don't happen. So um, with Burp Suite, it's fairly easy to find them, just looking at our sitemap for anything with parameters, try putting in some different inputs for the parameters, and there we go, we'll be able to potentially get an exploit. Now I wanna mention as well, we can of course send this to our intruder as well. And we would be able to, you know, inject information into this product ID. And for the payloads, we can put in a bunch of random garbage to see if anything works. Um, it would be sort of like a, an elementary version of fuzzing the application. And um, as I mentioned before, one of the benefits of this is that if we have an application, we can go ahead and set up like a word list of known like vulnerable inputs or known uh, bad inputs that have caused errors in the past. And we can continually test it every time we have a new build just to make sure we haven't broken something or caused a regression. So this is our first example of information disclosure.
For our next example, we're going to take a look at um, disclosure through backup files. So I'm going to go ahead and access this lab and we'll take a look at what sort of things we may be able to find here. So upon first accessing the lab, of course, we have a very similar setup to our previous one um, where we have our different like products, we have our different resources, um, and we're able to access the different products through the IDs. Now, in general, we may be able to get a similar exploit as before, but one thing that we can demonstrate here is that there are different URLs of interest in web applications. Um, one of them is robots.txt. What robots.txt does is it tells search engines um, what sort of information it should index and what sort of information it shouldn't index. If we ever see disallow, this typically tells us something that they don't want search engines indexing, which in turn tells us something that may be of interest to us. So this backup directory here is something that is disallowed. So if we try to navigate to the backup directory, what we'll find is that we're able to access it. And we can see that we have a product template.java.back. And inside of here, we can see information about the, um, the uh, SQL server, which includes things like the location, the username, and what we assume is probably the password, as well as the SQL query that's being used to actually generate the, um, the information. So this is all, of course, of great interest to us, because if we have the password, then we know all the information we need to be able to exploit this web application. So in general, things like robots.txt are really good places to look for general information disclosure based vulnerabilities. Now, the last thing we'll take a look at is an authentication bypass through information disclosure. So let's go ahead and access this lab. And one of the things that we're going to try here is we're going to try accessing um, some of the different login pages that exist. Um, one of the login pages of interest is actually just backslash admin. When we try to access this, it says admin interface only available if logged in as administrator or requested as localhost. The or requested as localhost is very interesting to me because it means that maybe I can manipulate my request to appear like it's coming from localhost. And that would be a perfect job for something like Burp Suite. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to turn on my proxy. I'll turn on the intercept. And what I'll do is I'll try to access this page again. So we'll come back here. We'll go ahead and press enter and try to access it. So we see that we have a get to admin. And I'm going to send this to my repeater so that I have it available. And then I'll turn my intercept off because I don't need that anymore. Now, when we send requests here, we'll see that we get responses that tell us that the admin interface is only available for logged in as the administrator. One thing that I can do to try to get more information is I can try changing my submit method from a get to something else that may be of interest, you know, something like a put, something like a post. Um, one that's particularly interesting is a trace. The trace will give us general information about the actual request that we're sending. When I do this, you'll see that it returns back um, a lot of good general information about our request in general. So we can see information such as like, um, you know, the, uh, the user agent, for instance, um, you know, just general information about the request. But one thing that's of interest here is this X custom IP authorization. And I can see that this IP appears to be different from localhost, of course, and potentially maybe this is what we're using to determine if localhost is being used as the access method, like, um, you know, if the request is coming from localhost or if it's coming from somewhere else. So this trace has returned to me information about a header that I didn't really know was being sent. This means maybe I can take this and add it into my request and maybe that will allow us to be able to compromise the web page. So let's go ahead and try that. Let's just copy this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, so we'll generally just, um, just copy this data here. Uh, let's do a copy. And I'm going to add this into my header. So I'm going to add the custom IP authorization portion. And I'm going to keep the IP the same just to um, show what generally is happening here. So if I keep the IP the same and I send this, you'll see that nothing really changes. Now, if I change this IP slightly, like I put down dot 60, for instance, and I try sending this, you'll see the IP changes to match that. So we can see that in general, it's taking this information at face value of whatever I'm inputting inside of here. So if I want to make my request look like it's coming from my local hosts, I'll just put like the local host IP in the 127.0.0.1. .0 .0 
when I send this, I see that it gives me that exact IP address. So now let's change this back to a get and see what happens. You can see that when we do this and we render this page, I get access to the administrator page where I can delete users from the web page. So this was generally able to be done because we were able to run a trace which told us header information that we shouldn't have been able to see. Since we were able to see that information, we were able to tell what IP address is being used and how it's being used in general. And then we were able to add that into our header, adjust it to localhost, and make it appear as if we were coming from localhost even though we weren't. This kind of request tampering is something that's very um, useful to be done through Burp Suite because we can easily intercept and resend packets, um, adding whatever information we need. So this sort of general experimentation is very easy to do through Burp Suite. So this will generally give you a good amount of information of how we can take a look at information disclosure related vulnerabilities and be able to exploit them using Burp Suite. So this should generally show you some applications of Burp Suite for information disclosure related vulnerabilities.